Okay, perfect. Let's get started then. Now we are in the realm of automatic machine learning. And uh, last session we covered the NASNet architecture, specifically the NASNet search space. And then we had two options once you have a search space to optimize over that search space. One is actually you have multiple options. You can do random search, you can do reinforcement learning, and the other option is to use genetic algorithms. There is also another option, uh, Bayesian optimization, etc. So all of these methods are gradient free. And why is that? The reason is because you don't have the gradients. You just evaluate your network on the validation part of your data set. You get a number and that's going to be the feedback that you have. The other problem is that your input is discrete. For instance, you have a choice between 3 by 3 convolution or 5 by 5 max pooling. So I think we covered enough about automatic machine learning to get us, to get us started and know what the literature is trying to do. There is also another paper that I want to discuss before moving to the next topic. The idea is that uh, you usually start with the baseline and let's see what type of modifications we can do. We can change the resolution, increase the resolution. We can make our blocks wider, basically have more channels. We can have more layers. And these are the type of uh, changes that you can make to the architecture. So we saw some papers that were trying to do to make their network wider. We had some networks or some works that were trying to increase the depth of the network and make their network bigger. And the idea was that by making it deeper, you're uh, increasing the receptive field. And you're seeing at the end of the last layer, you're able to see perhaps the entire image by making it deeper. The other idea is just uh, use higher resolution. This paper is saying that there is a delicate balance between uh, all three of these changes that you can make to your architecture. And there is a delicate balance. If you do only one of them, you're not going to achieve as much as doing a combination of all of them. No matter how deep you do, you go, you'll, you still need to make your network a little bit wider. And you still need to in increase the resolution slightly. So there is a delicate balance. We need to do them all. But how are we going to parameterize the search space? So for that, let's introduce some notation. Let's say D is a depth scaling coefficient. So we, for instance, the depth scaling coefficient here is two. So each one of these, we are copied and we are copying them two times. This one, we are making it two times. So that's the depth scaling coefficient. You can have a width scaling coefficient, which is gonna multiply the number of channels by W to make it wider. Or even you might want to make it less wide. It's just a depth coefficient. It could be less than one or bigger than one. The resolution scaling, we are gonna call it R. And this is our problem. Not only we care about accuracy of the model and we want to change, we want to optimize over depth scaling, width scaling and resolution scaling parameters, but also we want to remain within our memory budget. So this is our budget. Our memory should be less than or equal to the target memory. And we have a budget for the floating point operations, depending on the target device. And the idea is to maximize that subject is to these two constraints. And we are changing D, W, and R. So the paper is smart. They introduce a compounding scaling coefficient, and let's call it phi. And uh, this is how you can strike a balance between D, W, and R. So there are four parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, that you can find easily by grid search, by training on a smaller data set and training a smaller network. And then if you want to make your network larger, all you need to do is to play around with phi. And as you change phi, D, W, and R are gonna change. And we want to have this relationship between alpha, beta, and gamma. And this has to do with the computational cost. Let's see what we are doing. Alpha correspond to the depth. So the amount of computations that you do scales linearly with the depth of the model because you only have one for loop on the depth. So it scales linearly. So there is alpha to the power of one because it's a linear relationship. Then you have beta. Let's say beta corresponds to W. 
W corresponds to width. That's your width. And because you are doing matrix multiplication, the computational cost of increasing the width is a quadratic function of W. That's why you see a two here, because you have two for loops now when you increase the width. A similar story is for uh, gamma. Gamma corresponds to the resolution, and the resolution, you have two of it. That's why you have a two here. So this is a computational cost. And if you set phi to be one, that's the entire computational cost of your baseline network, which has a baseline alpha, baseline beta, and baseline gamma. So you start with the network, it has alpha, beta, and gamma. The computational cost is gonna be a function of alpha, beta squared, gamma squared. And how do you find alpha, beta, and gamma? The optimal ones. You, you just do a small grid search. These are three parameters. You put the grid in R3, and then you find the best alpha, beta, and gamma. You choose alpha, beta, and gamma on your grid. You train your network. It's gonna give you a validation accuracy. That's gonna be the number that you're gonna try to optimize. And then you find the best alpha, beta, and gamma on a smaller data set, and your network is gonna be small because phi, we are assuming it to be one initially. Yes. So it's gonna be an exhaustive grid search. Any other questions? Okay then, now let's see what is efficient net. Solving this problem is tough. Maximize the accuracy subject to constraints. Maybe we can do some sacrifices because in the end it's gonna be a multi-objective optimization and multi-objective optimization is tough. So what are we gonna maximize instead? We want to come up with a single loss function. And the idea is that you can maximize your accuracy times flops over the target. So we are gonna ignore memory for now. So it's gonna flops over the targets. And then this omega parameter is gonna balance the trade-off between accuracy and you trying to make this as close as possible to one, or you try to minimize the flops. So this is basically how you, how you find alpha, beta, and gamma. And this is gonna be your efficient net, the base structure. You're gonna have a three by three convolution with this many channels and you have one layer of that. And then MBCon stands for mobile inverted bottleneck. And we saw that. We saw that in mobile net version two. An inverted bot bottleneck, we saw it in mobile net version two. And uh, this is basically our alpha, beta, and gamma. This is your structure that we are gonna start with. The cool thing about this is that now you can change a fee and come up with different architectures depending on the choice of your fee. And I think this is a good wrap up to what we have been covering so far with respect to efficient networks, small networks, large networks, and the networks discovered by AutoML. This picture is sort of comparing most of them. So we covered this squeeze and excitation network. It has a lot of parameters and it's giving you that much accuracy. We have ResNext is lying here. These are human designed networks. Inception, ResNet V2, exception, we covered that. We covered this, we covered that. We covered DenseNet, we covered ResNet 50, and Inception V2. These are human design networks. And as you can see, there is a Pareto frontier because it's a multi-objective optimization. The idea in multi-objective optimization is that you want to push this curve uh, up to the left, up and left. So you want to push it to the next curve. And this is what happened with neural architecture set, neural architecture search net, NASNet. This one we covered. This is the first paper that we covered in AutoML. And uh, again, NASNet. This is the paper that we covered last session. And this is the other one. And these are all of the efficient nets. And the change that you see here, these different dots, when you have more parameters, corresponds to this fee. So you're changing only one parameter. And phi is not optimized over, but alpha, beta, and gamma are optimized over. Phi is just gonna help you, give you one parameter to explore the, far, the Pareto frontier and give you different architectures depending on your target uh, device. You're gonna choose either B0, B1, B2, B3, or B7. That one was for number of parameters. You can have a similar plot for number of plots. Floating point operations, and you're gonna have a similar plot. Now the point is, the point of this paper is that you need to strike a balance between the, bit, the width of your network, the depth of your network and the resolution. If you keep increasing, let's look at this yellow 
dash line, if you keep increasing the width, that's going to be your Pareto frontier. And you're saturating, I don't know, around 80% accuracy. If you keep making your network deeper and deeper, you're going to saturate around, uh, again, 80% accuracy. If you keep increasing the resolution, that's what you get. But if you balance it with phi, the parameter, the compound coefficient parameter, this is what you're going to get in the end. So the question is, should I make my network deeper? Should I make it wider? Should I increase the resolution? The answer is do all of them. And this is an empirical evidence of that. And if you compare ResNet 152 with EfficientNet, you have much fewer parameters. You have the same structure here, much fewer parameters. Squeeze and excitation network, much fewer parameters. But the accuracy is similar. Any questions before I move to the next topic? No questions? Was everything clear? Okay, perfect. So let's close the chapter of automatic machine learning. The literature is growing and we are not gonna be able to cover everything, but these were the most important papers in that field. And it should be enough to get you started if you want to do research or you want to do work in that field. Now you know what the state of the art is and how to push it forward.